get started. Uh, so if anybody has general questions, wants to ask them, we got one in the chat, where to start on the project. Yes, the Google Doc. Uh, if you have a more specific question, I'd be happy to spend some time in lecture talking about how to get started on the calculator and the <coughs> microwave. Uh, but yeah, the first place to start is obviously the Google Doc. There's something in that doc that you don't understand, you know, ask a more specific question. If you are just at a complete loss on how to get started, well, Monday's lecture, today's lecture, Friday's lecture. I'm spending a whole week to teach you how to do the state pattern. Um, and of course, ask questions during lecture. If there's something that you conceptually are misunderstanding about the state pattern, ask away. Please ask. Uh, these, today's lecture, Friday's lecture, we won't, I, I, there is some slack time in there, so there's time to answer your questions. Just uh, stop me at any time, shout them out, and we'll talk about it. So first, we're going to talk about the jumper game. I mentioned this a few times, and just to make it concrete, in case uh, some of you didn't, um, didn't take a look at this, I want to make sure everybody knows what exactly we're talking about. So we want this game. Any of you who did Physics Engine, you were able to complete all the objectives, you know that you can play this game and see it in all its glory, we can move around, jump around this game, and what this is is a 2D vertical scrolling platformer with two players. And the goal is to jump up these, oops, jump up these platforms faster than the other player. So I have one player, this player that I'm jumping with right now, using W, W, A, and D as its left, right, and jump buttons, and the other player, which is now off the screen and lost the game using the arrow keys, left arrow, right arrow, and up arrow. And the goal is just to jump faster than the other player until, um, until that player is off the screen, and you win. So what we want to talk about, we've talked about this a few times, and we'll recap the physics, how we got physics working in this. But what we want to talk about today is the jump mechanic specifically. So if we notice, if we jump in this game, and I'm holding down the button throughout the entire jump, I can jump at a certain height, if I'm moving while I jump, I can jump at a fairly significantly higher height. So I can do a run jump and jump a little bit higher. If I hold down the button like I am versus tapping the button, I'll get a smaller jump. And depending on how long I hold down the button, I'll get different heights to my jump. So if I don't want to have the full jump and I want to land right on a platform, which is part of the strategy of the game, try to jump just high enough so you can land on the platform. So I'm not doing too good of a job there. But, uh, but that's the idea. If you turn around midair, see how, how I can move with quite a bit of velocity while I'm jumping? If I turn around midair, I'm going to be going significantly slower after that turnaround. Uh, so we have some different mechanics to this jump. It's a very complex jump mechanic. What we want to talk about for most of today is how we can get all these mechanics in that jump using the state pattern. So all the different states that our player can be in, what do those buttons do in those different states? So that's our overall goal, just to make that concrete for anyone who did Rhyming Dictionary or didn't finish the Physics Engine. Um, that's what the finished product looks like. If you did finish Physics Engine and didn't play it, you haven't had your lab yet and, and show this to your TA and you just didn't run it for whatever reason, uh, run it. I mean, you can actually play that game. You built the physics for that game. Uh, enjoy it. Have some fun with it. So let's go to the slides and talk about this. Any questions after, with that, with the setup? Or any previous lectures, anything? Any open-ended questions? Open questions that haven't been resolved? Yes, question. Oh. Yes. So you'll get some feedback, and you know. So there's only well for the twelve people in chat. Anyway, the the question is, um, if you completed the homework, uh, if you did the homework by last Friday, completed the three testing objectives, but didn't finish the primary, still there's there's still a chance to get it. Yes, uh, you'll get some feedback. I don't know exactly what it's going to look like yet because it's going to depend on your lab, how the lab goes, the verification, the demo. Uh, and what the specifics that you missed on the primary objective. But you get some feedback from me. Either I'll say, uh, yeah, you got the whole spirit of this assignment. Here's the point. Here's the credit. Or you didn't quite get there, but here's what you can do to make that up. And here's a new deadline of when I want to see that by. So there will be some feedback similar to the learning objectives where I'm going to say, you didn't quite get there with this round, but you know, here's what you can do. 
Like if it's something simple, like you misspelled something, that'll just give it to you. Uh, but if there's something fundamentally wrong with your primary objective, then I'll just say, hey, you know, here's, here's a hint, here's where to look. Finish that by whatever time. Uh, and that's why I have the deadlines as uh, May 8th, it seems so far away. Is May 8th on those, just like I do the lecture questions? Because I don't know what decisions are gonna be made. It could potentially be all the way to May 8th. That, I don't wanna go that far because then people will be doing five <coughs> homeworks in one week at the end, so. Um, but potentially all the way up to that, depending on each situation. All right, any other questions? State pattern. So the lecture questions uh, today and Friday getting a little more complex. Monday we got our feet wet with the state pattern. Uh, now we're getting more complexity and seeing how we can leverage the state pattern to have quite a bit of complex functionality, just like the jump mechanic that we're seeing today, without too complex of code. And what we'll see with the state pattern is that there's a decent amount of work designing our programs. That's probably the question of where do I even get started on these projects. There is a lot of design work that goes in before you even start writing a line of code. Uh, so we want to talk about how to design, given a spec sheet, given all this behavior that we want, how do we design our API, how do we, which the API is given for you in this one, uh, how do we design our states, what states do we need, and what functionality do we need in each state, and what are the transitions between those states. Once we answer all those questions at a design level, writing the code shouldn't be too difficult should just be doing the grunt work and just getting the, the text on the screen. Uh, but the design is where we're going to do a lot of the work for these homeworks. You should be spending more time with pen and paper, just like I did with my solutions for calculator and, and microwave. I spent more time with pen and paper just drawing state diagrams than actually writing code. Writing the code is uh, pretty quick. So with this, uh, what we want to do with this lecture question, write a class T, uh, named TV, capital T, capital V, uh, don't have that lowercase v, don't make that, that mistake, that's a big headache. Um, TV, with these five methods, volume up, volume down, mute, power, and current volume. We want to build uh, a lot of functionality with this. I won't read every line of functionality, but the general idea is this TV is off. We can hit the power button to turn it on. We hit the volume up and volume down buttons while the TV is on to adjust the volume. We hit the mute button to turn off the volume and we can access that current volume with that current volume method. So current volume should be the current volume that you're experiencing at that moment, but the TV is going to still store some internal state uh, variable for the volume. So for example, when the TV's, if you have the volume set to seven, you mute it, current volume is going to return zero. You unmute it, current volume is going to go back to returning seven for that volume. For testing this, Write this test TV class, test suite, and for testing, as always, but worth reminding, especially for these ones, as you add a lot of more functionality than what's listed, only test the functionality through this API. Create a new TV object and call those five methods. So what you'll do for your testing is hit some combination of these four buttons and then call current volume and check that that's correct. The current volume, that's the only thing you're actually, you can actually test in this one because nothing else is defined in the, uh, in the API itself. It's not defined in the, the description. Yes, you'll have some state variable probably named volume, but you can't access that directly. You have to ask current volume for its value because I might not have a variable with the same name on the server. So we have current volume is your only way to access some state to be able to test uh, what this is. This came up, uh, I was talking to a student after a lecture Monday. You can write more tests and test your specific functionality and test uh, like what state you're in and things like that. Uh, but don't put that in your test TV class for your submission. So you can do extra testing outside of that if you want to test your specific implementation. But the test TV class that you're submitting for Autolab, uh, that can't use anything other than these five methods because you have no guarantee that my code will have that. So that still stands, uh, but it gets, uh, it's more prevalent now that we have this more, uh, you'll have a lot more functionality than what's defined here. You have multiple state classes with many methods that you might want to test. You probably should test in other testing, but not for the submission in the test TV class. Uh, yeah, I don't wanna go through this bullet point by bullet point, but uh, uh, the one thing came up in the, another lecture. When the TV is first created, the internal volume should be five. 
So internal to this TV, it'll have some variables with the volume set to five, but it will be in the off state. So if you just create a TV and call current volume, it should be zero. And then as soon as you turn it on, the volume is going to be five. That's what it's going to start with as soon as you turn it on. That for that first time, it'll be five. Then after that, when you hit the volume buttons, you're changing the volume, so you change it to three and turn it off, and then turn it back on. The TV should be at volume three still after that. <laughs> Same with muting. If you change the volume to six, and then mute it. Volume up, volume down, and unmute should all have the same behavior. It'll unmute the TV without changing the volume, so the volume would still be six if any one of those three buttons were pressed. But while it's muted, current volume returns zero. As soon as you hit one of those three buttons, current volume goes back to returning six, and those buttons start having their other functionality again. Right, any questions on the question itself? So, uh, so I just showed the demo, so we got the idea we're on the same page of what the game is. And we added physics to this. We saw that we had platforms and walls extend static object, players extend dynamic object. And then we can throw those platforms, walls, and players into our game world as static <coughs> objects and dynamic objects. And through the magic of polymorphism, this game just works with our physics. So if you did the physics engine homework, you built the physics engine that this game runs on. And this game, through polymorphism, was able to take your physics engine and apply the physics to this game to have those platform collisions, landing on platforms, hitting the walls, and, uh, and being able to jump, having gravity applied to those jumps. Uh, we, all that works with your physics engine homework. There was no, nothing extra that you had to add. That, uh, that GUI, the game itself, just calls your physics engine methods. So to do that, we had this jumper object, which extends static object, then platforms and walls extended jumper object. So by transitivity, platforms and walls are static objects, and they work uh, completely compatible with our physics engine. Then we overrode the collide with dynamic object method to get rid of the default behavior, which was just strictly for testing, just store the inputs in state variables and overriding it with game-specific logic so we can have the collisions behaving the way we want them to behave. We also had player extend dynamic object so it can move around in the game. We want this, the players to be able to move around and have physics applied to them, uh, have gravity applied to them. And the way we're going to have this react to our physics engine is have, have the game set the, what I'm referring to as the intended velocity for the player. So when the player is hitting the keys left, right, up, we're going to set the velocity in the appropriate dimension for the player, and then the physics engine is going to take that over after that. Uh, if that's not a valid move, the physics engine is going to say, hey, you collided with a static object. That static object is going to say, hey, you can't go through me, and uh, prevent the player from actually executing that, you know, that move, actually making that move. So if you're up against a wall and you're trying to move into it, the physics engine collisions are going to prevent you from doing that. You're not going to be allowed to move through that wall. If I try to move through this wall, it doesn't matter how much I press that right button. It's not going to do anything. The game itself is trying to set my velocity to go into that wall, and then the physics engine, the way we have the collision set up in the, the wall set up, it zeroes out that intended velocity. So throughout the, the game, as things are happening, and especially when we go into the code, we're going to see that just setting the z and the x velocities to some intended movement, and then the physics engine takes over after that. So how do we do that? Well, let's start thinking about uh, what can move, or what can trigger movement, and that's the user inputs primarily. Left, right, and jump, A, uh, ADW are the arrows. We have these keys, which are going to set some intended velocity, then we're going to take care of it from there. Uh, and what we really want to talk about, the good stuff is the states, is depending on the current state of the player, of each player, we're going to have different behavior from those keys. And that's, of course, the, the primary thing that we want to talk about today, is how do these button presses have different behavior depending on the current state of the player. All right, so let's look at our spec sheet for this one. Uh, this is what we want to end up implementing. Here's all the features that we have. Some of these I mentioned in, in the, when I was running the demo. 
If I hit the right and left, I should be walking, jump, I should jump, I should jump higher uh, if I'm moving or if I'm holding down the jump button for longer. If I change direction while I'm in air, I should have a slower movement, which we saw. You can do a good, nice run and jump with a lot of momentum, but if you try to backtrack that, if you try to change direction, let's have that at a slower speed uh, to be uh, uh, a slower speed if you turn around. Uh, if you jump up through a platform or land on a platform, you should have different behavior. That one's already taken care of with the platform itself, but we do have to be aware of the states that are changing, when, uh, especially when we land on a platform. We're going to have a state change. So we do still have to be concerned with that, but the platform is going to take care of our intended velocity uh, with that. If I walk off an edge, I should fall off of it. Uh, and then <laughs> if you re re we reach the bottom of the screen, all input should be locked. You shouldn't be able to do anything. There's, if you go off the screen, it's not like you're just existing down here and you can still jump up and recover. You just can't do anything. You're game over at that point. Uh, you can't move at all. So how are we going to do this? Of course, we could do this without states, but my guess is no matter who writes that, it's going to end up being some jumbled mess of code. If you don't, uh, I shouldn't say that. Not, with, not if you write it without states, but if you don't have some approach that's doing what states are doing for us, in organizing our code, uh, separating the concerns across our methods and across our classes, and having some organization to our structure. I think naturally most of us, with the, the task of implementing this thing, we're gonna have a couple of huge methods that handle all of this stuff. We might have a left press method, a right press method, an up press method, and that's going to handle all of the stuff. We're gonna have the big, if we're in the air, do this, if we're on the ground. Uh, we're gonna just naturally write our code like that. So let's see how we can use the state pattern to organize this code a bit better and uh, help us reason about our code in a better way, make it easier for our code to actually write our code. As we'll see, the, there will be a lot of work to design our structure, our architecture for, uh, for our program. But once we have that design, actually writing the code is going to be fairly trivial. Uh, we won't, I don't think we'll see a method with more than two lines in it. Uh, which will be which will be common if, in your homeworks and lecture questions too. In my across my solutions for the three lecture questions homework, uh, the microwave homework, the calculator homework. I don't think I have a method with more than five lines in it. We have methods that are starting to get fairly large and bulky, especially if you're getting close to like ten lines. You might want to rethink your design and rethink your approach a little. You might have something that's holding you back in that. Uh, you might possibly want another state to handle that logic that you're adding. Uh, I, think, I think I pushed five lines in a few of my calculator methods, and even those, I could trim them down. I'm just being a little sloppy in those methods. I really could trim those down to like two or three lines. Um, but there's, I just didn't see a need to um, at, at that point. Uh, so easy to, and easy to expand. When we, we don't have any complex methods that we're trying to modify, we should be, should be very easy to add new features, which we'll see by the end of today. All right, so let's take this approach that I mentioned in the last, the last lecture. We have this spec sheet, just like you'll have, uh, you have for today's lecture question, just like you have for Friday's, you'll have for Friday's lecture question, and just like you have for the two homework assignments. You have some specs that you need to implement. Where do we start, which, uh, which is getting at the actually answering the question in the chat. Uh, where do we start with this once we have these specs? And this is what I recommend, is start by figuring out what your API will be, then decide what your state should be, and then decide what the state transitions will be. So the API, this is any, any methods that will be called by the outside world that are going to have different behavior based on my current state. And that's all the functionality that I'm going to defer to the state for. And that's, those are the methods that I'm going to put in my abstract state class. Then whenever I have situations with different sets of behavior, so something where all of those methods don't have the exact same definitions, that's going to be a different state. And I can name those states and reason about those. And then all the transitions, what events can occur that are going to trigger these state transitions. And when I read the, the API, I'm going to pick out some keywords. Let's start with the, or when I read the spec sheet, uh, first I want to look at the API. Okay, what are the interactions that the outside world has with my class? that I have to handle? What are the methods that are going to be called on this? And if I look through this, I see a lot of keys. Okay, I, I'm getting the idea that there are some keys that some user is going to be pressing. Those are certainly events that I have to handle. 
I had to have that somewhere in my code. So we have three keys, left, right, and jump. And if I read through this, it, I'm getting the feeling that I have different behaviors, whether they're being pressed or released. So I can start to think, okay, I think I got six methods in my API. These three buttons, and they can either be pressed or released. When somebody releases, uh, releases the run button, uh, well, I'm using the, the press here, but when they release, I should stop walking. When I press, I start walking. Uh, I also have land on platform, another event that can happen that's going to have different behavior depending on my current state. So landing on a platform is another thing that can happen that's going to go in my API that my states are going to have to handle. What's going to happen when this event occurs? I'm going to ask my state because it's not always going to be the same thing. And most of my states landing on a platform won't do anything because it just doesn't really exist. If I'm already walking on a platform, how can I land on it? Uh, so most of the time that has no functionality, but if I'm falling, that will have functionality in that one particular state. So I got my API, I have seven methods, and those are the methods that I'm going to defer to my state. Those are the methods that my abstract state class is going to have, either with, as abstract methods or as methods with some default behavior that all states will inherit and override as needed. Next, I want to look at the different sets of behavior that I have. So I want to look at what, are, what kind of what states I can be in where I'm going to have different behavior. And I can start picking up the nouns here. Walk, jump, or the verbs, rather, in this case. Uh, am I walking, standing, uh, jumping, falling, or reach the bottom of the screen? These are all uh, states that my player can be in where I'm going to have different sets of behavior. So I can start reasoning about that and get my states. So I have seven API methods, my uh, five states, and then the last step is coming up with my state transitions. State transitions, there's quite a bit of them, but they're not overly complicated to get. Uh, walk left and right when the keys are pressed. That gives me two state transitions. If I'm standing and I push left or right, I'm going to transition to the walking state. If I'm walking and I release left or right, I'm going to transition to the standing state. If I'm walking or standing and the jump button is pressed, I'm going to transition to the jumping state. If I'm falling and I land on a platform, I'm going to transition to the standing state. If I'm walking and I walk off a platform, I'm going to transition to the falling state. If I'm jumping and I reach the apex of my jump, the one, uh, the one state transition that isn't part of uh, an API call. And this one, we're actually going to have to pull in an if statement here. I haven't found a way to do this. I haven't taken the time to see if there even is a way to do this, um, get this state transition without a conditional. So I'll, I'll be using one conditional in this. Um, that's why this one doesn't make a good lecture question or a good, well, this is too much for a lecture question. That's why this one doesn't make a good homework assignment because uh, I just couldn't get away around this condition right here. But if I'm in the air, if I'm in that uh, jumping, that rising, which we'll end up calling it that rising state, and my z velocity is less than zero, I know I've reached the apex of my jump, and now I'm in that falling state. And I'm going to have different behavior whether I'm rising or falling. Uh, specifically when I hit a platform, when I land on a platform, that uh, do I transition into this standing state, or do I keep rising up through that platform? which we could probably do with the, through the physics engine and through the platform itself. You might not quite need two different states for that. Uh, but this is the way we have it designed uh, right now. Uh, and then from any state, you reach the bottom of the screen and it's game over. So with all that, we arrive at our state diagram. We have these five states, and we know how we move around these states. We, we, uh, and we also have the API. I'm not showing the API in this slide, but we have the API for these. Once we have this, once we have everything designed, we've extracted the API methods, we extracted the states that we think we're going to need, and, and, uh, and we have an idea of what the behavior is in each one of these states, this is where things start, in my opinion, at least getting a little easier. Now I know I can take this diagram, go to the code, create an abstract state class, extend that in five other concrete classes, and for each one of those classes, uh, and define the API in the abstract state method, the state class. And then for each one of these 
five methods and implementing each method at a state. That's where things get a little simpler. Okay, if I'm falling and the player presses the left button, what happens? Each one of those methods is a nice small chunk of functionality that's a lot easier to reason about. If I'm, if I'm walking and the player hits the jump button, if I'm walking and I fall on a platform, what happens? Each one of those methods, fairly straightforward to implement, shouldn't rack your brain too much on those. So once you get past the design part, the actual implementation isn't as hard as it would be. It won't always be easy, of course, especially if you want really complex functionality. Um, but you'll, but it'll be a lot easier to reason about than trying to have this whole design of this whole program loaded in your brain all at once, trying to think of how all the pieces move around and interact with each other. Once we get to this point, we're building each little piece of functionality one at a time, basically in isolation. If I'm in this state and this method is called, what's the expected behavior? What's the behavior I need? And that's going back to the spec sheet. When you're writing each one of those methods, go to the spec sheet and see uh, what's, uh, what's the behavior, what does the spec sheet sh say this behavior should be? So the lecture question, you'll have probably, uh, not to give away too much, but, but uh, three states on, off, mute. And then you have your five API methods. You got 15 methods to write. Look at the spec sheet. What's my expected behavior in each one of these methods? And what are the state transitions in those? If I'm walking, and oh, that's a bad one. Uh, if I'm standing and somebody jumps press, not only do I need the functionality of that jump press in the standing state, but I also have to have a state transition. So I'm going to set my z velocity to whatever my jumping z velocity is from the standing position, and uh, transition my state to rising. And this is state diagrams, strongly, strongly recommended. You should be writing these state diagrams. Before you write any code, you should have your whole state diagram written up. For the microwave and calculator, uh, of course, they're more complex. But, uh, but what I recommend, think of your initial state. Our initial state would be standing here. I didn't put it on the slide. Uh, think of your initial state and what's the functionality of every single button on that thing in the initial state. Uh, and you can give that state some name. You'll want to name it at some point once you get a better feel of what these states are doing. Um, but you know you have a, a state that's going to be the initial state, and th all those buttons have some certain functionality. And then for each one of those button presses, when do you press a button that's going to change the functionality of any other button, of any button on that calculator? So for example, you're in the initial state. You hit 3 and then plus. On that plus press, it's, uh, the functionality of many of the buttons on the calculator have changed on that press. Well, that's a good indication that you've just changed state. So you know you have two states there, and then what other presses can you have that are going to change the functionality of at least one button on that calculator? Those are all going to be different states. And then as you start generating all these states, you start figuring out the, the different sets of functionality. Eventually, you're going to get to some state that's going to be identical functionality to a state you've already written. And that's when you can start closing up the, the loop, closing up your, your state diagram and saying, hey, this state and this state that I'm writing are exactly the same. I must have just transitioned back to that state over there. And that's when, uh, when you can start wrapping things up and getting the end of your state diagram. Uh, and also, uh, the design of the calculator specifically and the microwave, uh, they're based on real world things. If for the calculator, pull up your desktop calculator and start playing around with it. Some of the specific functionality might be a little bit different, uh, but just start playing around with that and getting a feel for how it works. And the microwave, it's, I mean, it's based on my microwave at home. It works just like that one for the most part. Uh, but, uh, but I think it's pretty common functionality for most microwaves. Uh, and actually, some of it I had to make different for my, my microwave. I found out, <laughs> quick side note, my microwave, if you hit like 10 uh, and then cook time and then 20 and then start, it'll cook for 10 seconds with a 10 second timer and then go to 20 seconds and count down again from 20. I don't know why I would want that feature. Uh, and I've tested a bit. I'm pretty sure you can't set different cook uh, power levels for the two timers, so I'm not sure why that exists. Unless I'm mistaken and you can do different power levels, but I tried to do two different power levels and uh, I didn't see it doing that. So.
Uh, so I didn't put that in the doc because that's just ridiculous. I don't know why I'd want that feature. Uh, you can also, while it's running, just without hitting stop and clear and entering a new time, you can just enter a new time while it's running, which I thought was a weird feature. <laughs> but anyway, so I didn't add those ones in. But, um, but it's based on real world stuff, so just play around with the microwave and see how it works. Play around with the calculator and see how it works. Get a good feel for this. And get, uh, get a good feel for the different states. Because like here, the states make, kind of make sense. For the lecture questions, the states make more sense. A TV can be on, a TV can be off. But with the calculator and the microwave, they're more of internal states, especially the calculator. The states are more internal. They're not necessarily exposed to the user as cleanly as the lecture questions. So it gets a little trickier, Intend intentionally, of course. They're homework assignments. They're supposed to be trickier. Can you apply the state pattern to solve these more complex problems? All right, with that, any questions on the state diagram? Is there a limit for the amount of classes in the project? No. Uh, for, for the homework especially, no. You can have new packages, new classes. Uh, stick with the model package. You can create sub-packages within that. Uh, but try to keep it in there just so your code's all in one spot. Uh, but you can create as many classes as you want. I've had, I don't recommend it, but I've had students on the calculator assignment create uh, up to like 30 or 40 classes with 30 and 40 different states. Uh, if you're getting to that many states, you might want to rethink your approach. Uh, for reference, my solution has six states in it. So if you, you want to aim for that target, if you have significantly more than that or less than that, you might be on the wrong track. Yeah. Um, in your state class, if you have a method that does the same thing regardless of state, would you just say what it does in that state class? So just yeah. you call it up? Yeah, so if you want common functionality uh, across all of your states, yeah, you, put that, you can put that in your abstract class, define it there, and then all the other classes extend that. And inherit it. Or if it truly is the same for every single state and you know it's always going to be the same for any state that you ever come up with, I'm thinking like a clear button, that usually has the same functionality for uh, anything ever. Uh, just don't even put it in your state. That could be actually in your base class, like in our player class directly. If it's not going to change with state ever. It's a strong design decision though, uh, out there in the real world. Like here the specs are fixed, but if you know you'd have to know that you're never going to want to put that in your state class. Mm -hmm. So if you do want to change that, that's a real big pain. It's kind of like putting a value for a variable. You never know when you're actually Yeah, you might want that to change at some point, and then, yeah. Um, yes. Does it have inductees in Scala? Uh, kind of. They're called traits. They basically do the same thing. Um, so the question, do they have interfaces in Scala? Um, there, there are traits, but they're not quite like interfaces. You can have... Uh, yeah, I forget off the top of my head, but there's some certain restrictions. You can do more than uh, a Java uh, uh, interface. I forget exactly what. I think you can implement some methods, but you can't have constructor variables. I forget what the actual restrictions are. But yeah, there are different types of, of stuff. I'm sticking with the abstract class just because uh, we got enough to learn. <laughs> so Yeah, if you want to use traits instead of abstract classes, by all means, do it. So there's another uh, thing we can recall back from last Monday. It seems like forever ago by now. We can uh, leverage inheritance to organize our code a little better. This is something we don't have to do, this is optional, but it's uh, recommended, it really is helpful, is we have these five states, and they're all going to extend our state class, but we have some states that have a lot of common functionality, going, uh, going way back to our health potion and ball classes that had a lot of common functionality. We have the same thing here. Standing and walking have a lot of common functionality. Rising and falling have a lot of common functionality. Well, here we can leverage inheritance and factor out the common functionality and put those, that functionality in some base class, uh, in some abstract classes on ground and in air, and then extend those classes with our concrete states that we have. So now on ground is going to have all the functionality of any state where the player is on the ground. There's a lot of common functionality there. And then standing and walking only have the functionality that's different based on whether the player is standing and walking. And this, again, helps us out when we want to expand. We want to have a running and a speed running state. 
in a ducking state, uh, we can extend on ground and just add the functionality that's different when you're ducking. Maybe ducking just lowers your uh, lowers your jump height, uh, just like the, the assignment. Lowers your jump height, lowers your speed, or, or increases your jump height, rather. I, I think we did the, the power jump, right? Uh, thinking of Mario 2. The increases your jump height, decreases your movement speed, and maybe you can't transition from jump, uh, duck, to walk without going through the standing state, without transitioning through that. We can add that functionality and just extend on ground and not have to start from square one from the state and implementing that, uh, all those functionality. Same with in air, rising and falling are gonna have a lot of common functionality. Factor that out, put it in air, and now if we have more in air states, we're just going to extend in air and implement one or two methods, whatever we need to add to that functionality that we need to change between those states. So let's take a look at the code and see what this actually looks like. Uh, of course, you have access to this code. If you did the rhyming dictionary, go into the physics engine homework and clone the repo. All this code is in there, uh, with the exception of the physics engine. Obviously, my physics engine solution is right here. Uh, but other than that, this is in that repo. You can take a look at all of that, all of this code. So to start, we have our player extends dynamic object. We saw that part already, so this can move around in our game. And I have some constants. Uh, just some extra functionality in the player class specifically. We don't have to focus on this too much. This is just stuff that I, I wrote to, uh, to get the code a little cleaner and get some nice functionality. I want to set this, uh, the different speeds, these values. These aren't defined in the spec sheet. If this was an assignment, I would have defined these in the spec sheet. Uh, so, but I have to come up with some values for these. So I have these uh, jumping and walking uh, velocities. And then down here I have some helper methods that are not called from the outside world. These are called from within each state, whenever the state has to change the velocity of the player. And it's going to get those, uh, to use those velocities and set the intended velocity to whatever value it's supposed to be set to. Uh, when I have it set up like this, if I want to change the player's walking speed, I can just do that, and that changes everywhere. I don't have to chase around everywhere where I hard-coded this walking speed. I change it once, and it's done. Uh, and if this is a game that we want to release out there, and I did some tweaking for this, but if it's something we want to release out to the public, we're going to want to fine-tune these variables quite a bit to make sure we have that exact feel that we want to the game. I played around a bit just to make sure uh, these are reasonable. I want, like, at the peak of your jump, your you're reaching the next platform, I don't want it to be short of platform. So I did some tweaking like that um, to get these, these values. But if those are scattered across multiple states in um, just a mess of code in general, it's harder to do that here. I can make those changes and have that reflected everywhere in the code for both of the players and the, the game. You know, that, that change is easy to make. Um, so I have my state initially standing. I have some extra code here. I don't want to talk too much about this either. Um, but I have some extra code to check if a key is being held down and then converting that to more presses that are being called on each frame. Uh, the, uh, yeah, I don't want to talk about that that much. But it's just some, some code that I made to make the game run smoother. If you just hold down a key with the GUI that I'm using, the JavaFX and ScalaFX, it'll send that signal at a pretty slow rate, like every other, like every second or twice a second, I forget what. Uh, but it's very slow, so if you release that key, you're not getting that release signal for a while. I don't know, it was just, it was messy. So I added this just to make the game run a lot smoother. But it has nothing to do with the state pattern that we're talking about here, so I don't want to talk about it too much. But, uh, but I do have the API methods. Left press, left released, et cetera, the ones that we saw. I'm going to defer to the state just defer to the state for all my functionality. Uh, and then on ground, that was the platform collision. That was our seventh method. And if, again, a few more helper methods just to get the functionality that I needed. Uh, is alive, that's just called by the game so I can get the, when a player dies, I just want to get this message. And that's where we would have like a player one win screen or whatever um, that I didn't end up uh, that I don't have in this because I want to just keep climbing and showing it. But anyway, let's get to the good stuff, the state. 
So player state, again, a little bit of extra code to check. Uh, I don't use this time and state, but this is where, where we can add more functionality. How long have I been walking? Do I want to transition that to a run? Uh, is the functionality in mind there? I didn't end up using it. This is complicated enough. Uh, but, uh, but this is the one I need where I do need one conditional. If I hit the apex of my jump, call the falling method of the API. So one extra thing. Other than that, it's the seven methods that we've seen. Seven methods that we've seen and then a few internal, more internal ones that are specific to our application. Uh, I do actually give default implementations for all these methods. So technically, this doesn't have to be an abstract class. I can actually create a new, I could create a new state if I didn't have it abstract. Uh, so if I don't override any of these methods, they're just going to do nothing with the exception of left release and right release. By default, are going to stop the player, which stop just set the x velocity to zero. And I have my on ground class. On ground extends player state and gives me any on ground functionality. Uh, pushing left and right should start the player walking. And then if you walk off a platform, you should start falling. And then standing specifically is going to have jump press do something different. It's going to use the standing jump velocity and transition to rising where walking is going to use the walking jump velocity and transition to rising. And then walking also has a little bit of other functionality. If right and left are released, we're transitioning to standing. And when left or right are pressed, this is more of just a quality of life thing. When, left, when those are pressed, they would walk and transition the state. But we're already in the walking state. And I have this printing out all my state transitions. If I didn't override these, I would just have a bunch of, uh, of state transitions from walking to walking in my console. I just didn't want that, so I overrode these to get rid of that extra output. Um, but I didn't have to do that. My in error state, if, if I change direction, I'm going to move, uh, have my mid air speed. So if I'm jumping in one direction and then I change direction, this is how I'm changing my speed. That's going to transition into rising. How long I hold that button down is going to affect how high I jump, but that only matters in the rising state. So while I'm rising, if I release jump, cut my z velocity in half. Feature complete. That's it. That's that's one of the huge advantages we get when we're using the state pattern. That could be a really tough feature to implement if we have huge methods with a bunch of logic in there. Here, well, that only affects my rising state and it only happens when I release the jump button in the rising state and then with just cutting the velocity in half, that's all I have to do. Got that feature. Done. Uh, and then as I hit the apex, as that's called when I hit the apex, transition to the falling state. Falling state, if I land on a platform, the platform is going to take care of our velocity, so I don't have to think about the z velocity, but I do have to worry about my state transition. We don't want to be landing on a platform and also in the falling state. We can get a lot of buggy behavior with that. So I've got to make sure my state transitions properly. Then game over, overrides everything with nothing, and is alive, returns false. So each one of those methods, it's only a couple lines, each method itself doesn't have a whole lot of logic. So you can see there's a lot of room actually, uh, there's a lot of room to be able to expand this. If we want to make the, the mechanics of this very complex and really fine tune a lot of different things, we want to add like triple jumps and uh, uh, backflips and you know different things. We have a lot of space here that's not cluttered that we could add all kinds of different behaviors depending on what we want from our game. And that's what I keep pitching with the state pattern with OP in general is that it makes our programs easy to expand. So let's do that. So let's add a double jump to this game. 
Uh, not like the triple jump I just mentioned. I was thinking of something else there. Uh, but the double jump, uh, if you haven't, if you're not familiar with platformers that have a double jump, what this is, is while I'm in the air, I can jump one additional time. So if I jump, I can get one extra jump while I'm in the air. But after that jump, I can hit the jump button 100 more times, and it's not going to have a, a second double jump. This also works if I walk off a platform. I get that one jump to be able to recover. So I get one jump, and I can reach pretty high platforms with this. Oh, no, not quite that one. So how do we implement this functionality using our state pattern? Uh, if first, if we have a whole mess of code, this could get painful. This could be tough to add this functionality. It, it'll be no problem at all with our state pattern. Um, but what we're going to do with the state pattern is add a few more states. We have a button that's going to do something different based on uh, some action that we've taken. So we have to have a state transition to a new state. We have a new set of behaviors for either before or after this double jump. So we'll have two new states, rising after double jump and falling after double jump, to disable the jump button after we've already jumped in the air. And we'll update rising and falling to, to have the jump button execute a jump, and then transition to its uh, a transition to rising after double jump, and rising after double jump transitions to falling after double jump after the apex, and these two classes have almost the identical behavior of these two classes. So this can just extend rising, and this can just extend falling, and we don't really have to write that much code to be able to get this done. So we could do this. Uh, and arguably, this is probably a better approach for this one. It's not too complex. It can't get too out of control uh, instead of introducing two more states. But, well, what if your professor says you can't do that? If you, there's no control flow. We're, we're going all in on the state pattern of this. This is going to be a state pattern solution for something like this. Uh, and then we get our new state pattern. Get a little more cluttered in here uh, with our two new classes with their respective transitions. And we can leverage polymorphism, so we're not actually adding much more code. We're just extending functionality that already exists and making the one change that we need. So if we look at this in the code, I glossed over. I purposely didn't talk about it uh, when we saw it last time. But in air, does have this jump press. Actually does execute a jump and then transitions to the rising after double jump. Whether we're rising or falling, this has the same behavior. So rising after double jump. Rising after double jump extends rising, so it's all the same behavior of rising, except we're going to disable the jump button. And when we hit the apex, we're going to transition to falling after double jump instead of falling, because we don't want to hit the apex and then enable another double jump after that. You can just jump infinitely. Uh, we don't want our players being able to do that. They'll abuse that. Uh, so we're not going to allow that. And then falling. No change except disabling the jump press button. We just override that with no functionality to disable that. And this double jump, the reason I do this specifically with the state pattern, very reminiscent of the decimal button on the calculator. The decimal button, when you hit that decimal button the first time, that has a lot of meaning. You are starting the decimal portion of this number. After that, it shouldn't do anything. It should be completely disabled. So to have a, a few extra states, uh, one, this is one recommended approach, I should say, uh, a few extra states that extend whatever state you were in, but when the decimal button's pressed, do the decimal button and transition to that state that overrides the state, extends the state that you had, and overrides the decimal button with zero functionality. And when we play this, if you finish the physics engine, I recommend doing this. There's this one line of code in player state by default, I have it commented out. But if you comment this in, every time we have a state transition, it's going to print the state that we just transitioned to. So as I'm jumping around, you can see the state transitions as we expect. Of course, I debugged the crap out of this, so they're all going to work the way they're